All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to our, uh, gosh, this is our fourth or fifth uh, live Zoom in our here today. It's really about car accidents and essentially what your car accident attorney, if you have one of those, kind of won't tell you about the, uh, the deal when it comes to car accidents. If you'll give me a second, I'm gonna let some folks in who have been waiting patiently. And now uh, everyone here is, uh, is joining us, which we're happy to have. Um, all of you folks joining us for what your car accident attorney won't tell you about accidents that you may be having. For one, I just wanna go ahead and uh, introduce Paul, but at the very least give him an idea of, hey Paul, I mean, uh, how was your day so far? Attorney Paul Samacow is joining us today. We're, we're so happy to have him. How's your day been so far, Paul? Well, thank you. Uh, you're starting off with one of these hard questions, I see. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, you know, I've had a pretty pretty good day. Um, you know, gotten a lot of work done. Uh, you know, made phone calls, made a little money for some clients. Uh, um, you know, with uh, with today's world, always had some tech issues, including getting on this uh, call with you with Zoom. Um, I think that's what the number one hot stock in the uh, in the entire world right now. And uh, you know, for me, it just doesn't like me. But here I am. So uh, you know, I'd have to give this a a double plus check mark on uh, how my day has been so far. Well, terrific. I'm, I'm glad you're here. And I'm sure all the folks who signed up to watch this are glad you're here. The people who are sort of scrolling by uh, live on Facebook are glad you're here. So it's it's not every day you get to talk to someone with your expertise um, in and around something that we never like to think about, which is getting injured in any kind of way, uh, especially in a car accident, though a lot of us aren't driving. We're probably going to start driving pretty soon. And I know I'm rusty oh, as far as driving goes. So I'm looking forward to having, a, I guess, a little bit of a slow burn into getting back into the driver's seat. Uh, all right, folks are coming in. You might see me sort of switch my eyes over to uh, what's going on here. And um, every once in a while, and I'll let some people in, there'll be some dinging. But like I said, we're glad that they're here and are looking forward to, uh, to the next steps here. All right, and I'm messing here with the views as well. Um, how this is going to go is very similar to previous calls and previous Zoominars that we've had. We're going to allow people to put questions in the chat. So if you have any questions about what's going on, please just uh, flip them here in the chat for Attorney Samacow, Dr. Samacow, I think we can call you when you're a Juris Doctor. Uh, uh, put them yeah, in there. Juris Doctor. Yeah. Juris Doctor. Well, that still counts in my view. Uh, right. Go ahead and put them there and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. I've got a handful of questions that I'll throw at you. Um, and there'll probably be some additional things you want to toss in for us to listen to. But so glad you're here, Paul. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, with you. that, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and share my screen since a lot of us are already here. Okay, uh, so here we are. If you came to what your accident attorney won't tell you, uh, then you came to the right Zoominar. And this is uh, one of the great photos of Paul Samacow. I know he's got a lot. Um, so happy to have him here, as I've said before. Uh, Paul's been in business a long time. I think he admits to 40 years on his website. And so uh, we're excited to bring his experience along with his expertise to talk about essentially what to do when you get into a car accident and some of the things you maybe don't ever hear uh, that you should basically uh, take action around when you're in this crazy emotional state of having maybe um, injured your car for sure, but potentially even injured yourself. And so what we'll do first is... Um, We'll just go ahead and learn about the firm before I formally introduce Paul. Paul, if you would, um, I'm certainly going to introduce you, but just give us an idea about your firm when it started, uh, how you got into law. I, I know there's a story there with your family and um, and what this firm has sort of turned into over the years. Uh, well, okay. Um, so is this going to last until Christmas or should I give you the Reader's Digest version? <laughs> we'll take the, uh, the, the summary of the Reader's Digest. All right. Um, I grew up, I'm dating myself, but uh, Perry Mason was a lawyer on TV when I grew up. And I just thought that was just the coolest thing in the world to be able to convince people to do things and convince judges and juries. So from an early age, I knew I was going to be an attorney. Um, what clinched it was when my uh, next door neighbors, we were very close to when I was a little kid, um, when their house burned down and my folks let them move into our house until they could make accommodations. So they were there for, I don't know, five, six, seven days. I don't remember, but it was a while. And I remember hearing a kitchen conversation between the adults where 
our neighbors were complaining that the insurance company was not taking care of them. They weren't paying for damage you know, to their house because of the fire. And that just sent shivers through me. I just couldn't understand that because I was old enough to understand what insurance was, but truly didn't understand how insurance worked. And that just got me mad. And it just redoubled my th thinking that I was going to be someone who was going to make things right for people. And, um, you know, I've navigated in 40 years, 35 of them have been handling injury claims, people who have been injured because others didn't do something they should have done or they didn't do something they should have done. You know, negligence. Most of my cases are car accidents or people fall down and they slip and they hurt themselves or a dog bite where the dog wasn't on the leash and should have been or, you know, even something like walking through the store and the box falls on your head because it wasn't, uh, you know, put up properly. So that's that's really the quick, you know, quick summary of what how I got to where I am, and I've uh, I've loved every minute of it. I've I wouldn't I wouldn't trade what I do for anything in the world. Yeah, well, glad to have you, and, and glad to have uh, your firm survive all these decades, as it were. Uh, just a brief synopsis about our firm. We've been around um, many fewer years than <coughs> Paul's, uh, but we try to do really good work. And here are some of the places that you know we've been on locally, as far as media goes, and even nationally, and some of the accolades we've been able to pick up along the way. But what we really like about our firm, and I think what separates our independent family wealth office from other firms, is that we build in three tools for our financial planning. Of course, we put together recommendations uh, for our clients, anywhere from 40 to 60 recommendations, and we give them about six months to put this process together. So it really sinks in. And there are conversations that happen over the pillow in between the meetings with us that I think uh, bring a lot more real intensity to what we're doing for financial lives, not just finances, but financial lives. The second piece that we do is actually give a guide around maybe the 40 to 60 recommendations that we put together for these families. So they know essentially when to implement some of these recommendations. And it's not just words on paper or numbers on paper, but there's a real idea about when you implement these things. And I say the, the last thing that we do, and this is incredibly distinct, is we build a family governance process within and maybe alongside the financial planning process. This gets into essentially family legacy, but also the past, how our clients grew up, what they're bringing to the table and what they'd like uh, money and life to mean in the future. Has very little to do with numbers and a lot more to do with feelings and behavior. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, legacy. These three tools, you know, the recommendations, the implementation and the family governance guide give families a, a real grip on what exactly we're not only doing today, but what we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, and I mean doing not just the numbers, but really what it works for our family. Anyway, we enjoy that and we love sharing that with our clients. But today we're going to talk with someone that is in an entirely different area, not something you typically get from a family wealth advisor. Um, what we like to do with our clients is give them access to people that are going to build a team around them. Typically, that's going to be an estate planner. It's going to be a CPA. It's going to be a mortgage person. And we've had some of those folks on already. Uh, but not every advisor also points in this, I think, necessity around someone who could be an injury attorney, someone who can be there in one of your worst moments in life. And today we've got Paul Samacow to uh, lead us in a little bit of a discussion and talk about some of those um, ideas around what you should do should the worst happen. Now, let me give you a little read up on Paul. If you didn't have time to look at his website, yes, I, I keep ribbing him whenever I see 1980 and I do the quick math. It's not 20 years anymore. It's 40 years, which is pretty amazing. So he's been in business a good while working really just focused on making sure people get in and around their injuries and get compensation if necessary. Uh, he's written not one book, not two books, but five books. And uh, there's a, a link that I'll send out later to download one of those books for free, I believe, Paul, right? So people can That's get correct. access. Ah, thank you so much for that. People can get access to this book, which, which I have. And um, this is a little bit what it looks like. You can't see on the tiny screen, um, but you'll be able to see a picture of it as I think you already have. So he's written five books, um, which is terrific. He's got a handful of offices in the area and outside the area, a little bit outside. Uh, he lists his, uh, one of his qualities that people are surprised about and, and may be surprised when it comes to an attorney as listening. Now that's that's really what separates him from a lot of other attorneys you might engage, someone who listens to exactly uh, what's ailing you and where he can find a way to help. One of the few attorneys that hands out his mobile phone number 
as well, which we actually have on the screen too. Um, the last thing that, um, that I, I'll speak to, and I know he has uh, a lot more to say about, is some deep roots with the Hispanic community in the area. Uh, that's something that I think over, probably over a couple of decades now, Paul, you've been able to uh, really engage. And I'd love to hear more about that. Well, when I began my practice, I felt like I had to, you know, bring clients in. I mean, you know, you can be the best at what you do and, um, you know, just allow me to take two side steps. Jason, I've known you for a long time and I got to give you all the kudos that are possible because, you know, I'm so proud of you watching you from the early into where you are now. You are the real deal and your clients are have a gift in having you. Uh, you, you are a sensational individual, and I know that the work you do is also beyond any measure of, of fantastic. So thank you for having me wow. on here. But uh, Thanks for saying so, yeah. You, you wanted to, um, to know, you know, how I got, you know, into a, a, that kind of niche market. And it really is just a simple, you know, decision that was made. You could be the best at what you do, but if nobody knows what you're doing, you know, you could sit there and you'd be playing darts all day. Um, when I first started doing this, I did a lot of research and was very quickly understanding that there's a very large segment of our community that isn't being properly represented. And that's people who are Hispanic in origin and Latino, and they often don't speak English. And I felt like I could go into that market and make my um, services known, and I would be able to be uh, someone that could be a resource to that community. And that's exactly what's happened. So, you know, I represent people of all different shapes and sizes and ethnicities and nationalities. And, uh, but a large number of my clients are Hispanic. Um, I, I think I can tell you very uh, honestly that I've represented people from virtually every country in the world where Hispanic is or Spanish is the primary language. Um, and if we keep going around the world, uh, you know, Washington is a melting pot for, um, you know, for, for nationalities and people here from all different places. I've represented individuals who are Asian. I've represented individuals who are from the Middle East. Um, I've represented people from Africa. Um, you know, so it's, it's just, uh, it's a pleasure to deal with lots of different people and lots of different cultures and I want to thank you for pointing out that, you know, you offered up that I, I like to pride myself on my ability to listen. And I think that's made me a better person because I really do listen. And when I have all the different perspectives from all over the world, um, you know, I'm certainly not a world traveler. I'd like to travel a lot more, but I think it gives me a unique perspective on people that maybe some others that don't have the diversity of clientele that I do or may not have. Oh, it's great. I mean, uh, during these days where a lot more of us are aware about the need to listen uh, and the need to appreciate other cultures, people of color, uh, you are setting the example and you have been for a while. And I thank you for that, Paul. I, I hope you continue um, and, uh, and really show people, you know, the, the way you've been able to conduct not just your life, but business as well um, by still engaging communities that, that really may need someone to support them. Um, with that, we're going to go now to the Q&A that we've proposed here. And um, as I mentioned before, if a question pops up in your mind that you'd like to ask uh, the expert here about really what to do in the case of a car accident or you've had a situation that's made you feel like, man, I, I wish I knew more at the time, um, but I want to make sure that the next time something happens to me, I'm not going to be the one that's uh, essentially in a losing position, then now's your opportunity. Put that question in the chat. And as they come in, I'll throw them at Paul. But for now, I'll just ask the, uh, the basic question that you pose on your website, uh, Paul. What's the, what are the first things? I realized that it was not one thing. What are the first things we should do when we get into a car accident? Uh, Jason, the very first thing you should do is just make sure you're okay. And more often than not, uh, people who have been involved in collisions, either even what we call low speed collisions, either you know, even at five miles an hour or rear end, um, it sometimes can take up to two or three days before you fully appreciate that uh, your neck or your back or both might be sore. Your muscles have been stretched. And, you know, because, um, because you get out of the car and you're conscious and you're cognitively all there, 
and you're able to walk around doesn't mean that you are 100% okay. Uh, the body goes into shock because of an automobile collision and shock is a process, you know, physiologically I could explain it, but it's not no reason to do that now. But the point is that physiologically pain signals are not getting to your brain. So when you are no longer in that state of shock about, Oh my goodness, I got hurt. My car, my, everything is, uh, you know, um, everything is, is, is spinning. Um, you want to just take a moment or two and just see if you're all right. And it's appropriate and necessary to get medical treatment to just make sure you're okay. And clearly if there's a serious injury, the first concern is getting someone to call, um, you know, medical services and ambulance, because, you know, the sooner you get medical treatment, the better off you're going to be long-term. Well, you know, Paul, the you next mentioned thing- medical treatment. If I can, if I can stop you there, because a question came in the chat and is there a time limit when you, Oh, there is. Claim? Okay. Yeah, tell us every, about that in your answer. Every state has what's called a statute of limitations and that's a time limit. So in Virginia, it's two years in um, Maryland, it's three years. So if you're injured in one of those jurisdictions, you have that period of time from the date of the automobile collision in which to file a claim or a lawsuit must be filed before that deadline. Because if neither of those happen, you know, when you say file a claim, I should say settle your claim out of court with the other party's insurance company. If you don't settle or file the lawsuit within the deadline, you wait one more day, too bad you're out of luck. Wow. Okay. And you were about to say something else before I jumped in. Did I? Well, yeah, you asked me for, um, you asked me for the things that you should do. The next thing you want to do, if possible, is take lots of pictures. Take a picture of where the accident happened. Take a picture of the damage to the car. Take a picture of the other person, if you can get away with it, that caused the accident. The more photos you have, the more likely it is that the claim is going to be accepted. Because look, um, you know, you have a lane change. And you want to take a picture of your car showing the damage, of course. But the other driver later on is going to claim that you came into their lane. So -hmm. if you can show debris on the road and that your car is to the right of the center line and, you know, the other car is sticking into your car, that's going to be pretty hard evidence to dispute. But if you don't have that documentation, it's my word against yours, you're going to probably lose that case, even though it wasn't your fault. So you want to get medical attention, you want to take photos, and you want to get all the information that you can about the other driver, their insurance, their license, um, all the different things that you can to fully document, you know, who's involved and what happened and where. And last but not least, um, I would share with your audience that insurance companies, I'm going to tell you something, they're the modern day equivalent of the devil, Jason. They will call people as soon as they get their identity and try and offer them money to settle the case. That's wholly inappropriate and it never is even close to being enough. So my advice is if and when an insurance company representative calls you from the other insurance, just don't talk to them yet. I know people want to get their cars fixed. So the only conversation really should be, okay, are you accepting responsibility and how can I get my car fixed? When they ask, are you injured? You say, I'll let you know. Uh, Oh, that's a key point there. Yeah. Not to mention anything there. Right. Because, and they might pressure you. Well, you have to tell me so I can complete the claim. Bull. You don't have to tell them anything. Just if you accept the responsibility that you're insured was at fault, when and how are you going to take care of fixing my car? And we'll talk about the rest later. People don't know how to stand up for themselves and they fold under pressure and start yammering and then they end up hurting their case. And like you said, in Virginia, uh, you got two years, and so you don't right. say anything day one. Okay. Well, yeah, but you want to, you want to, you know. Again, I mean, most attorneys, including myself, we work on what is called a contingency fee basis, meaning that we don't get paid until we recover money for the client. So we are all very happy to receive a phone call from someone and just ask us a few questions and pick our brain. No charge. Happy to talk to somebody to help them. Okay. And another question that came in the chat was, how do you know if you can know when you need an attorney versus when you should just handle it yourself? Um, you need an attorney if you have an injury. 
handling it yourself is a bad idea always because most people are not equipped to know what to do and how to do and when to do it. You know, I've had a lot of people who are 10 times smarter than I am. I mean, they have a string of degrees after their name. I mean, these are brilliant people, but they probably don't know how to do heart surgery. They don't know how to put a Maserati in the repair shop and fix it. They don't know how to do a legal claim. So intelligence has nothing to do with anything. Being nice and being helpful and being cooperative and being honest with the other person's insurance will end up getting yourself shot in the foot. You need an attorney. And people are saying, well, that's going to cost me more money. No, it's not. Because using the services of an attorney, even after the attorney's fee is taken out, 99.5% of the time results in the client getting more money than they would have gotten by themselves. And the reason for that is that an individual who is not an attorney has nothing to threaten the insurance company with. All they can say at the end is, I don't think that's enough money to compensate me properly. I'm going to go get a lawyer. Well, experience shows they don't get a lawyer. So they either never call back or they call back uh, with their head between their legs and they take the lousy offer. <laughs> the insurance company, on the, the, the attorney, on the other hand, can call the insurance company and say, okay, I'm representing this person. And now all of a sudden, there's a threat. The threat is that if you don't do something reasonable and fair, I'm going to file a lawsuit. And at the end, you might have to pay more money than you could have otherwise settled this for a lot earlier. So nobody wants to go to court, including the insurance companies. Insurance companies are animals of risk aversion. At the end of every week, at the end of every month, at the end of every quarter, and certainly at the end of every year, they look at how many cases are on their books and what is their possible exposure in having to pay claims. And if those numbers are big, they do everything they can to get rid of them because they want their investors and their stockholders to see smaller numbers. So getting an attorney is always the right thing to do unless it is that you just got a little bump and you went to your primary care doctor one time and he said, you're going to be fine. Take some aspirin and don't bother me again. And you are fine. Then you don't need an attorney. But if there's any, any, any even minor consequence where you're going to a therapy or a chiropractor or you have uh, x-rays taken or, you know, heaven forbid, MRI or, or CT scans. I mean, if there's anything at all, having an attorney is better and gets you more money and alleviates the aggravation of having to deal with insurance companies. Well, well that's helpful. Um, that makes, and it makes sense. Anything more than a bump, any kind of ongoing, get an attorney. And, and I'll just ask that the following question we have here on the list, uh, you know, you develop relationships with a tax attorney. If you feel like your taxes are complex, um, an estate attorney, you might just see once every couple of years, but it's still a relationship. Do you believe, and I know I'm, I'm asking a biased question for you, um, that people should have at least some kind of relationship with an injury attorney? Well, you know, I'm not a transactional attorney where I'm going to continue to be giving services to clients, but Having an attorney that you know and you like and you trust, I think, is always valuable. You know, look, we are not a world of people on an island unto ourselves. I like to think that me, myself, um, there are things that I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. And I hope that I'm smart enough in those situations when I'm stuck with something to reach out and to get information. And so that's what an attorney like me can do for people. Um, I don't just help people when they get hurt in an accident. I counsel them on their automobile insurance. I can give them all kinds of information. The book, they should absolutely download that book. Uh, it's absolutely free. Uh, accidentlawbook.com. So therein, you're getting information. And uh, just one, I, one, one small concept, Jason, most people think about money, the premium they're going to spend on their accident, on their auto insurance. That's not the, the proper analysis. Sure, you don't want to be spending double or triple what everybody else uh, is charging, but people need to have good, good coverage. Because if they don't, they're exposing themselves to risk and the reversal 
if someone else doesn't have good insurance and causes the accident, their own insurance can fill in the gap. So if you have small limits, you could be a hurting cowboy, as the expression goes. So I counsel clients on that kind of information and encourage them to get good coverage. And I can make recommendations as to what that coverage is. You know, typically it's not about the car. You could have an old beat up Volkswagen from 1987, but that has nothing to do with you and your body. You want to cover your body. You want to cover the potential for injury. So getting small limits insurance is a bad idea. And I explain that to people who sometimes had no clue. Wow. And, um, you know, where can you find what those numbers are? Somewhere in your insurance policy? Well, yeah. I mean, when you go online or call your agent, um, they're going to ask you what limits you want. So, again, with my book, you can, you know, look and see what those limits should be at a minimum. Um, oftentimes, they just say something like, ah, oh, you want the limits you had last year? And people don't even understand. And they go, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's the cheapest price, right? That's the wrong kind of conversation. Minimum limits in Virginia are 25,000. Minimum limits in Maryland are 30,000. That's nothing. What if you had knee surgery? I have one out of every 15 cases, people bump their knee up under the dashboard because of a violent collision. The knee surgery, the anesthesia, the physical therapy, the doctor's fee, before you even blink, that's 40 or $50,000. But if they only have $25,000 in coverage, again, they could be a hurting cowboy. So these numbers are there on a declarations page in your auto insurance policy. People should go and look at that. And I invite your audience to call me. Again, absolutely free. I'm happy to have them tell me what they have, and I'll make recommendations to them. And I'll put it out there right now. Yeah. A minimum that people should have on liability insurance is $100,000. So if you have a $25,000 policy now, let's just pick a number and say it costs you $180 for that insurance to make a multiple of four to get from 25,000 to 100,000, you're not multiplying the premium by four. From 180, it might go to 200. I mean, it's a minuscule additional premium amount for in increase in coverage, which is very important. Well, you know, and I'm looking at your book right now. I'm not sure if anyone could see me, but I'm on page uh, 21. And I, I think you'll have it as a download in the PDF if you go to the accidentlawbook.com. And that's where you go into uh, Maryland, Virginia, and the numbers. Um, so that's really helpful um, for certain. I, I think a lot of folks believe, and, and I'll ask the question, if I get injured in a car accident, doesn't my health insurance cover it? It may and it may not. It's a good thing if it does. In Virginia, if you're just having the, the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the standard routine policy of health insurance and they pay your bills, you don't have to pay them back. Now, if you have a government agency that you got your insurance company from, it's a, a government type sponsored or federal program, then you will have to pay some of it back. In Maryland, not so good, but still, either way, if the insurance gets involved, and even if you do have to pay them back, at the end of the day, you're still better off. And because your health insurance paid doesn't eliminate the requirement that the at-fault party's insurance company pay. So you get paid, in effect, twice. Great. And that's the way, that's the way it's supposed to be. There's a question here in the chat. How do you figure out an appropriate compensation amount for pain and suffering or other things that are intangible, such as the school bus driver being so upset by the accident that she can no longer work at her job? You know what, Jason? I get this question 75% of the time when clients hire me. What's my case worth, Paul? <laughs> and I say to them, do you understand the game of baseball? And they all nod yes. Well, I'm going to ask the client then, what's the score going to be at the end of the first inning? What's the final score going to be of the game at the end of the first inning? Can you predict? And they all say, well, we don't know. we got to play the other eight innings. So the answer to the question is, at the beginning of the case, there's no way to predict what the final resolution and compensation would be. There are hundreds of factors that have to do with the experience of the attorney, 
the jurisdiction you're in. So again, uh, Jason, um, you're an African-American individual and like it or not, if you got hurt in Prince George's County, that would be better than if you got hurt in Arlington County. Wow. Because Prince George's County uh, is predominantly made up, at least uh, ex to some extent, more predominantly made up of African-American individuals who are going to be more receptive to you. And an attorney who doesn't acknowledge that and understand it and deal with it is missing the boat. So, um, you know, again, with my Hispanic clients, there sometimes is a built-in prejudice about individuals who come before a court or a jury and can't speak English, but we do the best we can. But, you know, we look at lots of things. We look at jurisdiction. We look at the age of the person. We look at how long they were getting a medical treatment. We look at the the nature and extent of their injuries. You know, someone with one broken arm gets half as much money as someone with two broken arms. So there's no formula, but it is just simply a, a situation of the attorney looking at everything there is and evaluating it. And that's one of the things in my book that's titled the things your auto accident attorney won't tell you. Well, I will tell you what I think your case is worth after I've evaluated it at the end, when you're all done with your treatment. I don't want to evaluate your case if you're still going to the doctor because what happens then in the future wouldn't be considered. But I actually send a letter to my clients when everything is done with my evaluation. And it gives them an opportunity to consider what I'm telling them. And sometimes they've come in and they'd say, wait a minute, what about this? And I go, oh my goodness, I didn't see that. I didn't know it. So we increased the value. And sometimes they come in and they say, well, you don't understand my pain. Well, in fact, I do. That's why what I do professionally. That's <laughs> right. I do understand people's pain. And because they want more money doesn't mean they're going to get it. So that's a, a stark reality of, of our judicial system. You know, you can't just, you know, get into an accident and say, all right, well, I should get $3 million. That's not going to happen unless there's some devastating life-threatening injury where you can never be even one-tenth of what you were before. So again, in answer to that individual's question, there is no absolute answer. It is a process of evaluation considering as many factors as possible. Oh, that's fair. Uh, that's fair. And I'm going to combine the chat question with one of the bullets on here. Um, you know, one of the bullets is how do you work with insurance companies? And the chat question is, are some insurance companies worse or better uh, than others uh, with respect to settling cases fairly? Without question. We are in a war, plaintiffs, lawyers like me, with certain insurance companies. And we know who the good ones are and we know who the bad ones are. Okay. There are some insurance companies where I will not even bother sending them anything to try and negotiate with them. I just file the lawsuit because I know that if I try to negotiate with them, um, let me just give you an example. Let's say I think my client has a right to $15,000 in compensation. There are certain companies that will give me 13, 14, 15, 16. There are a couple that might actually give me 20. And then there are some that will give me six or five. So the ones that give me six or five or four, I don't even bother talking to them because I've now wasted a month, a month and a half. So I just file a lawsuit and we go to court. So absolutely, yeah. there are, the, you know, what is the name of that old song? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. <laughs> old and there, are, there are some, there are some that are so ugly, Jason, that I don't care who you are. You don't want to look at them. They're that oh. ugly. Now, just I, you probably don't want to name names, but are there the companies that advertise on TV? Are they more likely good, bad, or ugly? Um, I, I can't name names, and you know, there. The, I think I've seen ads from virtually every company. So okay. yeah, you pay you attention know, to them. The fact that they advertise just means they want you to to buy their insurance. That's all it is. It's an yeah. ad. Yeah, of course it's an ad. Of course. Well, tell us a little bit with the time left we have. Um, your idea behind the Samacau Club, that's pretty new. Oh, well, thank you for asking. Um, you know, I'm an attorney now 40 years, and the practice area is injury claims. But over the years, I've gotten hundreds, thousands of inquiries from people. And I'll give them my time as best I can here and there and now and again 
to help them with whatever it is that they have a problem with. And it all of a sudden dawned on me about, I don't know, a year ago, that people really do need legal services and it's expensive. You know, I think um, people are afraid of even calling a lawyer because they think that we're going to start the clock and bill them at our hourly rate. And so for that reason, legal services are not available to people. So what I did was I created a scenario where for $100 a year, $100 for an entire year, Jason, you can join the Samaco Club and have access to me for four 30-minute consultations and for up to 10, and that's in a year, four 30-minute consultations in a year and up to 10 email questions every single month and I will give advice. And wow. if at the end of that, there's a, a, an understanding that advice isn't just simply gonna cut it and they wanna hire me, then they hire me at a discounted rate. I charge $1,250 an hour. If you're a club member, I'm charging you $300 an hour. But again, where can you go and just pick the brain of an attorney for up to a half hour or send them an email and all of this for $100 for an entire year? Well, if I tell you that when I rolled this out, the website for registration almost crashed, I would not be exaggerating. We have so many members, it's just off the charts. Can I tell you a story about one member? Please. A woman called me up and she had been the victim of a fraudulent car sale. The dealership, a used car dealership, sold her a car and told her that there was only one owner. Well, it turned out that there were three owners and one of the owners was a taxi cab company in Canada. They wow. rolled back the odometer. So when you looked, it looked like there were 22,000 miles. Well, in fact, there were 26,000 miles on the vehicle. And then the PA steady resistance. You speak French? The PA, <laughs> the PA steady resistance. You know what a VIN number plate is? Sure. Well, a VIN number plate is supposed to identify that vehicle. There were two VIN number plates with two different numbers. One under the, uh, the front... Um, uh, uh, windshield and the other on the inside of the driver's door. So the woman was very frustrated. She had been talking to the dealer and they were giving her a hard time. She told me in confidence all she wanted was to get back all of her money and to pay off the car loan. Well, I accomplished that for her without ever filing a lawsuit and as a federal statute which allows her to get the higher of $10,000 or actual damages. So her actual damages were less than 10000 So I got the dealer to pay every single penny that she had put out and $10,000 and attorney's fees. And she got all this for $300 for hiring me because it took me less than an hour. Wow. That's a great story. That's a good one yeah. to have in your pocket. Thanks for sharing it. I was um, so happy for that yeah. lady. Well, yeah. Yeah, that, that's good stuff. I mean, I've been a um, years ago, I had a friend of mine sell me at the time it was called prepaid legal. Now it's called right. Legal shield. Right. Um, I, I still pay somewhere upwards of $50 a month uh, just to have it there in the background. And um, I don't use it. And so I got a lot of free hours built up. But um, yeah, $100 a year versus even $50 a month, which is how they sell it. Um, is a pretty good deal. Um, so I appreciate that. Well, if there are well, any other I questions used, in the chat, I, let's, let's get those questions coming because we're about to okay. get time. Sure. You go ahead, uh, Paul. I don't see any questions yet, but if one comes through, I'll interrupt you. Well, the model for my Samaco Club is, in fact, uh, prepaid legal and legal shield. They do a lot more, and it's a very good organization and a very valuable organization. So the width and breadth of what I do isn't that. And admittedly, I'm going to be candid. I can't do every possible thing that any potential client might ask. But then I have lots of friends who are lawyers, and I'll call them up and say, hey, I got this person. Will you do this on a discount for me? And they say yes. I got a fun question in here. Uh, 
you can take it however you you can because I don't I don't think I entirely understand it anyway. Uh, who's going to win the war between attorneys and insurers? Attorneys. Yeah. Why do you say that? Because ultimately, the cases go to court. Now, it, on a bigger scale, and that's a case by case basis. On a bigger scale. Um, you know, the number one most profitable industry in the world, Jason? I'm going to guess insurance. Nope. That's number two. It's okay. oil, the oil okay. industry. But insurance is number two. Okay. So on the on the bigger scale, insurance always wins. Yeah, but on a case by case basis, the attorneys win. And uh, this will be the last question for us today. Uh, do you take on cases that are small and however that definition of small might be? or does there need to be a significant injury? No, I take anybody's case that, that is in need of legal help. I don't care about my legal fee. If I make $500 or I make $50,000, I don't care. My goal is to put somebody in a better position having been through my office. And whatever my fee is, okay, fine. You know what, I'm gonna take the fee. I earned it, I deserve it. I got to pay all the things that I pay, just like everybody else. I've got salaries. Heck, Jason, I've got go. I've got fish in my fish tanks. I need to buy fish food for them. Yes, you do. But but my my goal isn't how much money I make. So I don't care if the case is big or small. My goal is to satisfy the client. I want that client to go out and say to someone that they know who got hurt, "Hey, you know this guy Paul. He's a really good guy, and he really did a good job." And working with his office was sensational. They kept me informed. They answered my questions. He didn't nickel and dime me for, uh, you know, little stupid fees. He did something he said he was going to do. He even did a little better, if that's the case. Uh, he let me make the decisions. This is a real stand-up guy, a great attorney. You should go to him now because, you know, he can help you. That is my motivation. That's why I do what I do. And... I just love it to death. I love my clients. I love that they honor me by hiring me. Um, it's a good group of people. They're, they're nice people. They got hurt. They didn't deserve what happened. And I help them a little bit here, a little bit there. And sometimes, you know, in, in bigger cases, catastrophic cases, I've handled cases where the family members have come to me and a loved one was lost because of a collision. And so I've helped those people too. And, you know, you feel bad because there's never enough money to cover the loss of life. But whatever money there is, we get it for them. No, oh, that's great, Paul. Uh, SamMcCallClub.com, AccidentLawBook.com. And I've learned from watching the video on your homepage, you give out your mobile number, 703-472-7688. Uh, what's what's the, uh, the thought behind that briefly? My job is at nine to five. It's not, you know, if somebody calls me Sunday afternoon or Thursday night and they got hurt, I'm going to talk to them. I mean, you know, what is it costing me? 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour? It doesn't matter to me. I've helped somebody. And, yeah. and you know, and if it's just giving them advice, okay. And if I get hired, great. But, you know, if I'm Saturday night, my wife and I are at dinner with another friend or couple and the phone rings, okay, maybe I won't answer it, but they leave a voice message and I call them back. And I call them back just to say, hey, I'm acknowledging your call. Can we talk in an hour or two? No, that's so great. It is, it is just something that I made a business decision and a life decision, and my wife supports me. So when the phone rings, she doesn't get upset. Um, you know, it, again, people, when they've been involved in a, in a collision, when they've gotten hurt, they are interested in information, and they shouldn't have to go you know, through the internet, calling lawyer after lawyer after lawyer after lawyer, or looking for internet questions and answers. They should be able to speak to somebody right now. Oh, goodness, how frustrating is it when you want to know something and you can't find out? Well, call me. I'll give you the best the best I've got anyway. No, it's terrific. Well, I'm going to everyone brace. I'm going to I'm going to go back to our bigger faces here. <laughs> and so we've got we've got our, our shots uh, a lot bigger here. Um, <coughs> Paul, I'm, I'm so glad that you took some time to join us today. Uh, I have to admit, um, unfortunately, I, I'm only an owner of two of your books. I've got the one that you've been recommending to folks. Um, everyone, he also has this Achieve Small Business Success book. I had the honor of going to his book signing, what, two years ago? Yeah, two, three years ago, yeah. 
two, three years ago. It's a, it's, it's not a thin book. It's a big book. Um, like we said, he's an author of five books. I only have two out of five, Paul, forgive me. Um, but Paul, before we go, are there, is there just one thing that you hope people learn from this, um, this Zoominar today that they can take home with them and, and maybe follow up on? I, we didn't discuss this, but I'm going to give your audience a message that I always give to everybody here. It's a two-pronged message. Number one, don't even think about using that mobile or cell phone when you're behind the wheel. Don't even think about it. It takes a fraction of a second to be dead because you weren't paying attention. Whatever you're doing, texting, surfing the internet, answering a phone call, making a phone call, looking at Facebook, it's not worth it. It'll wait. Put that phone down. The second thing I want to share with people is a philosophy that I have, and it's Maybe sounds a little cheesy, but you know, you ask, so I get to answer. <laughs> that works. I'm a believer in helping people. Doesn't mean you have to go out of your way 10 blocks or donate $500 that you don't have. But for goodness sakes, the woman that's carrying bags and, or the man who's carrying bags and they don't have a hand free, open the door. Donate some of your time to a charity. It, it you know, People think that helping other people is about the people you help. Surprise, surprise, when you help somebody, it makes you better. Awesome, thank you. Paul A. Samacow, uh, samacowclub.com, um, lawbook.com, what was it, accidentlawbook.com. Accidentlawbook.com. Accidentlawbook.com, so many ways to reach you, uh, so many um, opportunities to engage you and your services. Thank you very much for being on with us today. I think we've all learned a lot. We've heard a few things that are inspiring and um, I'm sure there'll be a few folks that reach out to you for a, a little more Q&A, perhaps privately, but thank you so much for joining us, Paul. It was an honor, uh, Jason. I'm hoping that you and I will get, get together for lunch sometime soon. One of these days we'll, we'll be human again and actually shake hands in person. <laughs> all there right, you go. take care. Everyone, right. uh, thank you for joining us. Um, know that you can reach out to Paul. I will follow up with an email. I'll turn this into a nice video that you can watch again in case you missed something. Um, but uh, once again, be safe. Follow Paul's advice. Don't text and drive. And we'll hopefully see you again soon. Take care.